So uh, first order business. Uh, we are here to celebrate young writers. Work. Um, we're celebrating young writers um, during a weekend where we are also celebrating one of my favorite writers who doubles as an iconic musician. His name is Marvin Gaye. Yeah. Uh, Marvin Gaye released an album 50 years ago called What's Going On. And that album, which was released in 1971, was performed here in its entirety with the National Symphony Orchestra in 1972. Right on, right on, right on. Um, that album uh, spoke deftly to what was happening at that time. Consider the Vietnam War. Uh, consider the birth of the environmental movement. Uh, consider what was happening in the black community. Consider the assassinations of uh, the Kennedys, of Malcolm X. Um, consider the rise of the Black Panther Party. Consider the volatility in our country's yearnings at that moment. So we thought, cool, we have an album that considers what's going on, but uh, what's going on now? So we asked three incredible um, DC-based organizations, all of whom work with young people, um, to explore that idea with us. So um, the youngest person that you're gonna see on stage today is in middle school. Yeah, shout out to that. And the oldest person that you're gonna see on stage is me. Uh, I'm gonna do a couple of poems as uh, the host. My name is Mark Famuti Joseph. I'm the Vice President of Social Impact here at the Kennedy Center. And uh, it is an honor to be uh, with you. Um, we believe in a thing called energetic reciprocity. <laughs> energetic reciprocity. So for, uh, for those of you that were completely silent when I said that word, you failed. But um, you have an opportunity to level up. Energetic reciprocity, which means if I give it, you give it too. Um, I give you, you give me back. And if the world operated more harmoniously like that, my lord. Cool. So I'm going to do um, a poem that is about being a dad and also about Marvin Gaye. And then I will um, introduce the first organization that uh, we are privileged enough to work with um, during this weekend and actually for several years at this point. So this is called You Have the Right. Uh, me and the boy wear the same shoe size. He wants a pair of Jordan 4s for Christmas. I buy them and then I steal them from his closet, like a twisted Grinch-themed episode of Blackish. The kicks are totems to my youth. I wear them like mercury on my black man feet. Can't get those young freedom days back fast enough. Last time I was really fast, I was 16, out running a doorman on the Upper East Side. He caught me vandalizing his building. Not even on some artsy stuff, just stupid. Of all the genders, boys are the stupidest. 16 was a series of barely getting away and never telling my parents. I assume my son is stewarding this tradition well. 16 was the low end theory and Marvin Gaye on repeat. 16 is younger than Trayvon and older than Emmett Till. At the DMV, my boy is in line to officially enter his prime suspect years. Young, brown, and behind the wheel, a moving semaphore signaling the threat of communities from below. On top of the food chain, humans have no natural predator, but America plays out something genetically embedded and instinctual in its appetite for the black body. America guns down black bodies and then walks around them, bored, like laconic lions next to half-eaten gazelles, bloody lips, America and the black body on some Nat Geo-ish. The boy passes his road test at the DMV. He does this strut, sea walk, broken Fortnite thing on the way in to finish his paperwork. Uh, true joy and calibrated cool under the eye of my filming iPhone. The victory dance of someone who's just salvaged a draw. He's earned this win, but he's so 16, he can't quite let his body be fully free. When he's three, I'm in handcuffs in downtown Oakland. Five minutes ago, I was illegally parked. Now I'm in the back of a squad car considering the odds that I'm gonna die here. 
15 minutes away from our kid who expects that in 18 minutes, daddy's gonna pick him up from nursery school. There are no pocket-sized cameras to film this moment, so. I learned a lot of big words at 16, getting ready for the SAT. None of them come to me now. In the police car, the only thing that speaks is my skin. I know this. I was parked in a bus zone on Broadway and 12th ran quickly to the ATM on the corner, pulled the cash out just as a police car came up behind me, gave him the all shucks, my bad face. Um, he waits till I'm back in the car and then hits the signal, takes my license, hand on his gun, comes back two minutes later, gun drawn, another patrol car now, four cops now, my face on the curb, hands behind my back, shackled. I'm angry and humiliated only until I'm scared and then sad. I smell like the last gasp before my own death. I think how long the boy will wait before he understands that I'm not coming. I think how his last barely formed memory of me will be the story of why I never came for him. I try to telepathically say goodbye. The quiet brings me no peace. The silence makes it hard to rest. In the void, there is anger, mushrooming in the moss at the base of my thoughts, a fungus growing on the spine of my freedom attempts. I am free from all except contempt, a spirit of an unarmed civilian in the time of civil unrest. No peace, just Marvin Gaye falsettos arching like a broken winged sparrow competing against the empty sirens singing the police. Apparently some cat from Richmond had a warrant out on him and when the cop says my name to dispatch, dude doesn't hear Mark Joseph, he hears Mike Johnson. I count seven cars and 18 cops on the corner, the pride around a pound of flesh. By the grace of God, I am not fed to the beast today. Magnanimously, the first cop makes sure to give me a ticket for parking in the bus zone before he sets me free. My boy is 16 now, enough body to fill my shoes. I have gray in my beard and it tells the truth. He has license to drive in the hollow city, to navigate traffic in the age of autonomous vehicles. You know, people say the talk, like that shit happens just once. Like my memory's been erased and my internet is broken. Like I can't read today's martyred name. Like today's the day that I don't love my son enough to tell him, bro, I really don't care about your rights. Your mission is to get home to me. Live to tell me the story, boy, get home. Today's talk is mostly happening in my head as he pulls onto the freeway and Marvin Gaye comes on the radio. At 16, inner city blues is watching black people commit to each other in love and parenthood on Spike Lee's cinema screen. At 19, flying high is debates about melanin's capacity to bind space and time, a pre-vibranium and drug-addled compendium of cosmos and black thought. At 28, mercy, mercy me is my toddler drawing rocket ships in the Maui sand, races between a boy and an ocean to etch permanence on a shoreline. At 42, I am older than Marvin was when he made the What's Going On album, and really curious how you make something so timeless before your time runs out. I am wearing the boy's shoes, and the tune in my head is the goodbye I almost never said. A goodbye the length of a wordless requiem, the length of a warning, a kiss, a whiff of his neck, the length of a revelation and a request, flying high in the friendly sky without ever leaving the ground. My pain is a walking baseline, a refrain, placated flush against the strain of my fading lifeline. This is not to be romantic, but to assert a plausible scenario for the existential moment. Driving while black is its own experience. Ask Marvin, it may not be the reason why you sing like an angel, but it surely has something to do with why heaven bends to your voice. The boy driving, the cop in the rearview mirror is a ticket to ride or die. When you give a black boy the talk, you pray he is of the faction of the fraction that survives. You pitch him the frequency of your telepathic goodbye, channel the love sustained in Marvin's upper register under his skull cap. Black music at its best is an exploded black hole responding to the call of America. At its worst, strike us down, the music lives dark, like tar, like tobacco, like cotton in muddy water. Get home to me, son, like a love supreme, a god as love, a love overrules, feathers for the angelic lift of the restless dead, like a theme for troubled man, or 16-year-old boy free to make mistakes and live through them, grow from them, holy, holy, mercy, mercy me. Mercy, mercy.
Okay. Thank you. And we are not at a golf tournament. Uh, uh, we are not playing tiddlywinks. Um, when the poet finishes, the proper response is um, massive. <laughs> um, and it's just like I sank a putt on the 13th hole. So we're going to try that again. Mercy. <laughs> that is fantastic. That is the appropriate level. Thank you, because these young, that is as tepid as you should be, because everybody else that comes up here is much, much younger and deserves much, much more. To tell you about the first organization that will be sending poets to the stage, I um, bring to you uh, my very good friend, the lovely Alexa Patrick, here to tell you about Shout Mouse Press. If you can hear the sound of my voice clap once, if you can hear the sound of my voice clap two times, if you can hear the sound of my voice say, mm-hmm. Okay, it's good to see y'all. My name is Alexa Patrick, and I am the programs director at Shout Mouse Press. Uh, let's see, by a raise of hands, who of you has heard of Shout Mouse Press before? Yeah, it's okay. Listen, I'm gonna tell you about it right now. Shout Mouse Press is a nonprofit writing program and publishing house that is committed to amplifying underheard voices. That's a mouthful, I know. What that means is that we work with young people of color around the DMV area to write books. So all of our books, we have over 50, already, uh, have been written by young people of color between the ages of 12 to 24. We have books for folks between the ages of like babies, we just published some baby board books, all the way up to YA uh, books as well. So, we have a couple of authors from our organization. Uh, they are going to read some pieces for you. We also have a nice little table back there if you passed it when you're walking in. There we have some more information about our organization if you're interested in learning more. Um, and we also might have some books for sale. I think we definitely do. So if you're interested, please find out more at that table in the back. Can y'all say in the back? Okay, word. Are y'all ready for the Shout Mouse Press authors to come grace the stage? Say yeah. All right, so I, I have their bios here. I'm gonna read them because they're full of accolades and whatnot, uh, and then they're gonna grace the stage. If that sounds cool, say word. Word, okay. So, Sasa Akil is a 20-year-old multimedia artist, writer, and the 2021 Montgomery County Youth Poet Laureate. Sasa has been featured in, in the Bethesda Magazine for her work as Youth Poet Laureate, as well as in the Washington Post for her work on A Man Was Lynched Yesterday Project in 2020. Can y'all say, okay, accolades. She has been active in the DC art community since age 13 and is now pursuing a degree in fine arts at Howard University. Okay. Yes, that's right, make some noise. I was actually surprised that y'all weren't like, H-U? Okay, yeah, just making sure y'all are out there, cool. All right, the second author who's gonna grace the stage is Najee Purvis. Najee is a co-author of the nationally acclaimed book, The Day Tejon Got Shot, and has graduated uh, from School Without Walls in Washington, D.C. Okay, we got some School Without Walls folks here. Um, she has presented her work on many stages, including Busboys and Poets, Gallaudet University, and the AWP Conference, and now the Kenny Center. <laughs> Uh, when she graduates, or she, said she has already graduated, but she plans to pursue a career in architecture and a minor in business. She plans to continue her passion for fashion and poetry on the side. Najee enjoys creative projects and helping the community. So if y'all can start making some noise right now, right now, for the first author, Sasa Akil. Welcome to the stage, girl. All that nonsense gone, get back with you. Don't got time to switch. What's up, y'all? How you feeling? It's a nice day.
this first poem is untitled. So I call it uh, Black People and Mermaids and Ocean and Ancestry. They say Ariel could never be black that black folks don't have red hair and can't swim, know how. They list all the reasons we have no right to this title, and I can only think of Hassan. Brown-skinned boy with hair red as fire, quick wit, quick smile, born with a sunset resting atop his head like crown. And yes, it's kinky, yes, it coils, yes, it's every bit as black as the skin he wears and the people he come from, I think of Yasmin. Low lids and mocha skin, long red locks resting on her shoulders like a cloak to keep her warm, red as Kaya and red as love, red as the day she was born. They say, black folks can't swim. And I think of my brother who loves the summer because summer means beaches and beaches mean ocean and bright sun that'll take his skin tone from caramel to warm, rich toast. He splashes in the water and does not leave it, swims and calls the fish his brothers, calls the ocean his friend, calls the sun his benefactor as he soaks in its rays. They say, black folks could never be mermaids. And I think of my ancestors who lived black and free in the sun until their capture, I think of the decision they made and how maybe they grew gills and fins instead of being crushed under the waves. They say, we have no right to this. And I think of myself, girl who feels called to ocean every day, whose strong hands and callous feet scissor kick and split the water with each movement, whose body is never more at peace than when it is submerged in water, when it is in the waves, when it is near her ancestors who breathed air and maybe water, I look at the place where sky meets sea and I see tombstone and birthplace. They say Ariel could never be black. And yet I wonder, what do white folks know about learning to breathe water because they would not give you air? Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Najee Purvis. <laughs> okay. So um, the poem I'm going to be reading today is called, What's Going On Now? Okay. You ask me what's going on, but the question should be, what's not going on? It's 2023, and for all of my 21 years, there's always something. 2002, I was born into a war. I had no idea what Iraq was, but it was hard to ignore. 2012, the Sheik Temple of Wisconsin Massacre. I was 10 and I became a big sister to a little black boy praying that he can live to be a grown man in this system. 2020, the year I became legal. And since then, my people keep falling. George Floyd, Dante Wright, Andre Hill, the massacre in Buffalo. Too many innocent people are being killed. What can I do? Well, let me continue to stand here and reflect on the way life has been for me. It has taught me to master my identity, to realize that my skin is some people's enemy. Seriously. More of this chronological disaster is that this country will be long for this better life, this great again, this America dream. It comes with too much and isn't as great as it seems. Children dying, governments lying, global warming and getting shot without warning. It's 2023 now. This life we live still brings chaos, corruption, and destruction. Different groups of people continue to question their own safety every day. People of color, immigrants, LGBTQ, even me, even you. This happens when our world leaders don't hear our screams and stop listening to our pain. They must use their power to do something. Instead of asking me questions, yes, I question my own safety every day. I watch my surroundings. 
when I drive, when I ride the green line, even at school, because cops are posted there too. I'm gonna keep it real. I don't know who my skin may offend today. Because yeah, we are all different, but we aren't all the same. They were our bodies and our culture had to still be asked about, it's just a shame. So world, don't ask me if I feel safer today. It shouldn't even be a question. Welcome to the USA. It shouldn't even cause too many disagreements unless everyone is ready to finally accept their wrongs and put some new ones into play. It's what my ancestors since 1619 long for each and every day. Word on the streets is, we can't even control our own bodies. This continent we live in is barely a democracy, honestly. This is a messed up world. No matter how hard we fight, our rights seem to be taken as a mockery. For this tragedy to change, it starts with me and it starts with you. Acknowledge inequality, speak the truth, change this unspoken animosity. So safety is never a question, but always an answer. I no longer want to question my own safety, neither should you. Again. This poem is entitled, When Asked About Justice, the Flag Said. You know me. I stand in the spotlight, center stage, never shy. I am proud pinnacle. Star spangled to mimic the night as if I were noble as she. I wave hello, goodbye, and good riddance but never offer a hand to flat clasp and friendship. My friends are the hypocrites and the ones who forget whose blood dyed my stripes bold. I've watched thousands fight for me, die for me, fight over me, under me. As I waved a silent anthem above their heads, I am golden door, sealed with lock and key, symbol of the free, you know, the ones with blue eyes, white skin and red blood. I am witness to that lynching, to that car crash, to that funeral, to that inauguration, to that battle in the name of freedom, but really just the prophet, the powerful, I am passive. I have done no wrong, simply stood where they put me, allowed them to craft for me a story of righteous contradiction. I posed for Georgia O'Keeffe and let them sing that song for me. Oh, say, can't you see? The scene where they sewed me back together after the Confederacy ripped my colors into bold cross lines. I didn't mind. Never really mattered who stood for me, only that I stood. I pledge allegiance to myself, for myself, because no one matters but me and I stand at the head of their movements. I stand for liberty and justice for few, and I rest on the coffins of the fallen ones because if nothing else, I can claim their bravery. I am the home of the brave, the ones who spoke up and were silenced. You don't even know their names. I am red, white, blue, and beautiful, star-spangled, striped, and fly, and I fly over this land as a symbol symbol of democracy, hypocrisy, and undeserved pride. I am American flag, a symbol of what is and what is to come and what was never what they declared me to be. I stand for the land of the free. Can't you see? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. How are we? We good? We good, right? Listen, man, it's about to be summer. I mean, which in DC is, comes with its own set of things, but it's about to be summer. Um, we are here in this great hall of inspiration. Um, Father's Day is tomorrow. It's a complicated holiday for many, but I will say as a dad that um, I'm very, very happy to have like an extra holiday because when I was growing up, um, you know, like it was about the ties and the socks, but I am so happy to have a day in my life where I too am the recipient of ties and socks. And so to all those that celebrate, uh, shout out to y'all. Um, some of you weren't here at the very beginning of, um, of our time today. Um, I see that we're filling up and that's uh, truly extraordinary. We are here um, celebrating not only these extraordinary 
uh, young voices, but um, all voices that aspire to an equitable American future. Uh, I'm from New York, I went to school in Atlanta, I spent most of my uh, adult life in California. Coming to DC and working at a place like this is also complicated. Um, I, I have begun to lean into the idea of American promise. And what we have here on the stage today are young people that are fulfillments of and authors of the promise that is to come. So um, we have the great privilege of working with uh, three great organizations that facilitate um, American Promise in the form of youth literacy and literary uh, ambition and talent. The second organization that I'd like to bring to the stage uh, right now is 826 DC. And to tell you a little bit more about 826 DC is my good friend Christopher. So please give it up for Chris. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Lee, and I am the Associate Director of School Programs at 826DC. We are a nonprofit organization that's on a mission to help students develop a lasting, positive relationship with writing that catalyzes their ability to live into their fullest possibility. We do this by offering free writing and publishing programs for students who are between the ages of six and 18 at our writing center in Columbia Heights. Uh, it's at 14th and Park Road, and also at DC Public and Public Charter Schools. Uh, we don't have a table set up, but if you all have any questions about our work, you can feel free to come find me after, or you can visit our website at a26dc.org. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from four students who've been a part of our programs. So give a hand for Kalea, Zanai, Kenyon, and Amira as they come to the stage. <laughs> My poem's called, Where is Love? When I was there, I would look at all the lovers out there showing how to love, I want to show, but how? But when I gave love, I felt like I wasn't giving enough. My box got too full that I bought a house to keep my love in there. When I share, I feel like I've accomplished something. When I feel free, I feel loved in ways that I can't quite explain, but it's more than what I can say. Love tells me give, give, share all, share the love that I have built in that house. Thank you. I'm not different because I don't like you or him. I like her and I'm allowed to. I don't have to be the same and wear pink and white every day. I'm different for a reason and I'm not changing for you. I will only change the plan, never the goal. My poem is untitled. I used to believe safety is when you're not in danger and you're protected. But is anyone really safe? At any moment, anything can happen. Who are you protected by and why? Do you think they will lie? Someone you love could hate you or someone you could trust could betray you. So I say to you, safety to me is a feeling, but a feeling you should cherish and keep tight. Because the safer you feel, the happier you are and the more you can enjoy life. Um, my poem is called Uplift Us. You degrade us and talk about our hair. You point and stare because you don't care. 
But you don't know about our Afros and the stories that they show. They're more powerful than you'll ever know. You degrade us and talk about our flaws. Oh, you're too big or you're too small. But when the white girl copies us, she receives a round of applause. Our curves are carved from the finest of clay. It's almost like it should be on display. You degrade us and say we're too dark or we're too light, even though our black skin radiates like the beautiful sunlight. You degrade us, but don't uplift us. But we don't need your validation. This is a new generation. You don't like my hair, I don't care. I'm going to wear it everywhere. As black girls are beautiful, as black girls are strong and can do no wrong, as black girls are magic. There's a million things I could say about us being the best, but we just need to stand up tall. Don't let their words get to you. Just show the world that you're that girl. friend Steven. Ayatsi, shout out to Union Labor. Shout out, shout out, shout out. Um, give it up one more time, please, for the young poets of A260C. Cool, excellent. Um, I'm going to do a poem before we bring up uh, words, beats, and life. Um, uh, before I begin, uh, a chance to just shout out words, lines, or phrases that you've heard thus far that have moved you in any way? That girl, yes. Mercy, yes. What's going on? Yet, yeah. see, understands the assignment. Justice. Black girl magic, yes. A whole lot of things I can't understand, but yes. <laughs> yes. Safety, yes. I don't need your validation. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Come on now. This is a 13-year-old a, a young lady um, preaching that. Yes. Shout out to Shout Mouse Press. Shout out to A260C. Thank all of you all for supporting um, these people. Uh, this is a 90s hip hop poem because, all right, somebody feels me. Uh, what, I most <laughs> what I most remember about being possessed is the quiet. Sealed in a vacuum of spirit, not much penetrates the membrane of Vodun possession. In the quiet, what I remember most about being possessed is my body vibrating like a bass line by a tribe called Quest. Tribe cracked the code for me. Afro hippie hip hop masculinity, an arc from first year in high school to first year in college where I stopped being reflexively ashamed to be Haitian. Tribe was the proto-masculine archetype for love and soulful cultural pride. They played the outside, but weren't a band of misfits. They were a band whose members everybody knew was cooler than the cool kids at your school. A group from around my way that understood the value of a fly love song. Bonita Apple Bone, you gotta put me on. The oracle of my awakening as a black American. Outside the cultural specificity of being Haitian American outside the realm of a Caribbean hierarchy that painted Haitians as the lowest. This band has a low end theory, and if you pay attention, it is an opus of admiration of Haitian beauty, by which I mean it is an altar to the bottom. You don't have to dig to the underworld, just find the low frequency and earth opens up. My people are from Haiti. First born on this soil, it's kind of my job to crack the code. How does a black boy become an American? How does he learn his role to play? And what if his role in part is to stand in his country's closet waiting for someone to imagine him as a monster in the dark? If I take everything that I love about being black and everything that I love about being an American, are those things themselves in a right or loving relationship? if not some legal charter, who gives us permission to be our greatest loving selves? Which brings me to Linda Ronstadt. Uh, I have three first memories. 
the first is an unfortunate incident with a uh, red fruit punch and my mom's all white romper. Uh, the second is driving through the safari at Six Flags and a giraffe leaning into where I was sitting in the back seat of our yellow Pontiac to kiss my cheek. True story. And my third first memory is my immigrant parents slow dancing in the middle of our studio apartment in Rego Park to a Linda Ronstadt record. How do we learn what love looks like? And what's the soundtrack for that love? Prom night. I kissed a Haitian girl with moonlight eyes in the back of the ride at sunrise. We were 17, and she'd just gotten her braces off. Honey, check it out. You got me mesmerized with your black hair, your fat ass thighs, clear and concise. A couplet of unequivocal code cooled by Q-tip while we're in the back of the whip with the prom fits. This Haitian cutie invites me to taste her lips. She tasted like pre-dawn magic. Like the feeling when I first heard Electric Relaxation's guitar lick, last day of high school, optimistic, a prom night first kiss on some romantic rap music shit. Tribe was playing first time I slept with a woman and also first time I ever held a gun. A symmetry that's probably not as uncommon as you'd think. Summer soaked post-sex talk with lavender and a piece under the pillow a spectrum of black light music so clearly lovingly constructed, I could recognize that these young males were artists. I could recognize myself in them, Caribbean descent, using hip hop artfully to become American men, represent, represent, zen. One teenage summer, I'd take the Q5 from 233rd in Merrick and Laurelton to the Archer Avenue train stop in Jamaica. I'd hop on the E train to Times Square, switch to the red line to 72nd. I'd walk four blocks to meet a girl who smelled like the rainfall you know is coming but still makes you wait. The feeling I had before she opened the door was the sound between the needle drop and the first note, the eternity between anticipation and pleasure, the Winnie the Pooh aphorism that although eating honey is a very good thing to do, there is a moment just before you begin to eat it which is even better. The sound of that anticipation is tribe sample from Mystic Brew. Relax yourself, please settle down. It releases the hips and lower back like two Haitian lovers listening to compa while their children giggle in the corner. I have grown to become a man who traffics in codes. Legibility is the double-edged ambition of the immigrant and the unstitched hole in the black American's pocket. I was in college before I heard a dude on the radio love up on my country women in an uncoded way. I like them brown, yellow, Puerto Rican, and Haitian. Haiti is first to slave revolt last in life expectancy, our family's lasting legacy, black sovereignty and poverty. Who are we now that we've crossed over to the other side? When is it globalism and when is it genocide? I am the first generation walking family blood through its last rites. Paint me a snake in a field of crosses, inside the music, on an instinctive path, a love movement, still learning the role to play, a quest to be self-possessed of love. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, the last organization that we will be bringing to uh, the stage is Words, Beats, and Life. I will tell you a little bit more about them after we hear from our poets. But please, right now, I want to bring Sanaya and Malachi to the stage. Y'all, please give it up for Sanaya up first. Yes, yes, yes. Keep it going. Keep it going. Okay, can everyone hear me? Moving. Are we moving? Within that question, there's a statement to be made ever staying still in the presence of pain, suffering clouds of heavy rain, bang, 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 guns fire, hands raised in surrender. 
A mother cries out through choking tears as she caresses her baby's head. Only 17, blood smearing their shirts. I ask you, are we moving? You answer yes. Slowly but surely, we are making ripples in the tide, adding a gust of wind to a tornado of fury, grief, frustration, but most importantly, passion. I see the fire in your eyes burning brighter as you tell me this. A flame of energy igniting inside you with every outbreak of news on TV until it becomes a wildfire, one that even the crashing waves of people wanting us to silence their names into darkness can never put out. It's those eyes that remind me of my brothers, full of hope and Light how I admire the way he sees the world. The treasure in it. The prayer kept beneath his smile for tomorrow greater than this. Dear black boy, how to tell them that in this world they judge you by the color of your skin? Dear black boy, how to tell them that they see but don't care for his hope? Don't care for his unrequited love for society that moves slow to change, but quick to drop a hashtag when yet another face, another life is taken by the sounds of sirens closing in. Black boys deserve to grow old. My father was four months into the world when his father was taken out of it. The police claiming the violence was necessary, my nana called it inhumane. Beating him like he was a dog. Black men deserve to grow old. My father's father died at 28. Black men deserve to grow old. My father's 41. Black men deserve to grow old. But on that screen, we watch as their last time breaths escape their lips. The artist of truth paints these words into a picture that apparently only some can see. The heavy cry of, I can't breathe, mama. Because, truth be told, the cameras are only pulled out if they're lucky. For others are still left unheard. I ask you again, are we moving? Feet walking across the streets in search of justice. We yearn for it. Longing to hold it tightly in our clenched fists that punch the air for words that have yet been spoken to offer them rest. Peace. And restless we are. Banners held high, tears flowing, voices dry from shouting, crying out together in unison, wanting there to be equality in every shade. For though we vary in colors and hues, all beautifully made. Red blood courses through all our veins. As we stand here today, asking, no, protesting for change, for if nothing changes, nothing 
changes. So, let me ask you again. Are we moving? Your answer is thoughtful. Silence. Head raised as your eyes look into mine. They're still filled with fire. But I notice now they were always stricken with pain. Confirmation that we aren't just moving. We are going to keep moving. Thank you. Can we get another round of applause for Sanaya, please? Incredible. Incredible. Wow. When I say spoken, y'all say words spoken. Spoken. When I say to be, y'all say heard. To be. To be. When I say ja like, y'all say yeah. Ja like. Ja like. If y'all don't know what just happened to you, I'm from D.C., and what I just taught y'all was a little bit of D.C. colloquialism. We say ja like. It's almost like a, a, like an emphasizer, you know what I mean? It, it helps speak about relative things. Today, um, I will be performing. My name is Malachi Malpractice Berg. I'm actually uh, 12 years old. I'm the youngest person to touch the stage, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but the compilation of poems that I will be performing will be speaking on my experiences as a um, um, was speaking on the, um, the three, three things that I'm extremely proud of, and that is um, being a graduate of Princeton University, that is being a black person, and that is being a DC native. At Princeton University, I am known as the boy that sings and raps and dances on his way everywhere that he goes. And I appreciate that. Because as a black boy at a predominantly white institution, y'all, there are far worse things that people have called me. But what I do not tell people is that this is my shell. That I often have to bend my bones into Broadway just to feel like I'm not backstage in my own body. And when I'm singing and rapping, and dancing, I'm nobody's minority. I'm nobody's 7% affirmative action, diversity quota, token black friend, I'm just my body. My spine stands tall and then emancipates itself just as well when I am dancing. The type of moves that make your organs move before your limbs. The type of strides that can make the privileged Princeton soil part for your belligerent, boisterous, brown souls. And can't nobody ruin this. Can't nobody police this. I make my body into a closed fist, something that can't hold the world but absolutely can threaten it. When I walk into class, I never mute the ciphers I start. Sweat jogs down my face, my breath brags about existing, and my chest beatboxes a song that makes the corners of my lips stretch into a smile, but makes my privileged classmates curl into disgust and discomfort, so we go to war, like my respiration against your convenience, like my lungs against your leisure, like your still against my dancing. Y'all, the most beautiful thing about dancing is that when your set is over, when your body stopped moving, you always have breath to catch. And as a child, some man of stone made my father into a collapsing mirror. Some apathy foreclosed my heart and evicted my loved ones. Then some girl, then some asthma, then some police officer, then some America, then some depression tried to strip me of my breath. But I am here with y'all and breathing. Look, mama, how my chest falls and then rises like daddy's body and then his spirit look Fox News it was never bring Princeton to the hood it was always bring the hood to Princeton and look Princeton how I inhale and exhale despite the toxic bigotry in this air because somewhere 
There is a brown body with a bar- with, there's a brown body with a barrel and a badge pointed at their eyes, their dropped body, just another beat in the acoustics of the genocide, just another tempo for my lungs to mimic. So when I get the chance, I make my dorm into a concert. Let go go Geppetto my core. Let Beyonce brandish this body, both Renaissance and Revolution, because loose limbs feel no chains. We didn't break, so the shackles had no choice. I didn't change, so the definition of what an Ivy League man looks like had no choice. So the next time you see me singing and rapping and dancing all at the same time, make your body into a closed fist with me and sing with me and breathe with me and dance with me. But how come the streets burned down and the MLK riots are now the ones that are most gentrified? How come my TikTok for you page looks like an advertisement for Clorox? How come I ask an urban person of color how metal will be the death of us? We look for the guns, but the cranes get in the way. How come I've seen more white chalk in the streets than I have in my classrooms? How come business folk love my city more than they love the people that made it? How come in my own city, my name is more likely to be a box in the morgue than it is to be at the top of a mortgage? The year is 2045 and I am the last native left in DC. A man on a bullhorn tells me I have three minutes to leave this city or they'll open fire. And this gives me a sense of pride because death doesn't scare someone whose home has vanished before his eyes. And I knew this day would come. I heard that if you scream at the top of your lungs in the city you're from, that breath will circle the earth and catch you when you need it most. So I pray that this poem be planet-sized propellers that prevent my people from being pushed across the Potomac because I vividly remember how the biggest neighborhoods were the first to go. I vividly remember how the place that I learned to read became a Trader Joe's and yes, the city was all triumph and we were that despite our pain. And if we're being honest y'all, I'm not scared of being robbed in D.C. today. I'm scared of Starbucks, dog parks and bike lanes. I'm being real. This poem started writing itself in 2012 when Southeast didn't have a trauma unit so Ward 8 victims were pushed to the bottom of the call log. It started in 2022 when someone told me they were from D.C. and they were really from Waldorf and what seems like a microaggression is actually the difference between ruins and a renaissance because language is the reason you hear violence and criminal and think of Southeast before you think of the Pentagon. So this poem is about how we are everything that we have always been. The year is 2045 and I am the last native left in DC. This place is not parsley for your palate. It is not an Instagram caption. It is not a revolving door. It is not a pit stop. It's not even the nation's capital anymore because no amount of capital can unbound the blood bond I got with these blocks, the soul ties I got with these streets. The year is 2045 and I am the last native left in DC. Muriel Bowser is on her 8 millionth consecutive term. Martin Luther King Avenue is now Wall Street. Skyscrapers lace what used to be the heart of the South Side and that big chair is all that I got left. So this city, I will 1969 ride for it, ride for it. Because what is a city if not the people that died for it? My people, my body belongs with us. It is not up for audit. Screw your mortgage. You do not own this land just because you bought it. The year is 2045 and I want you all to remember I as the native that always talked about his city like a state. Remember I as the last native that didn't bend or break. Remember I as the congas that never lost they crank y'all. Remember I, remember I, remember I died for the place that gave me life. Thank you. Yo, one more again for Malachi, please. I want to call all the poets up to the stage. Y'all should know Words, Beats, and Life is, thank you, is Washington, D.C.'s longest running, dopest hip-hop-based arts educational nonprofit. 
Over 30,000 youth and young adults served just last year alone. Shout out to Mozzie, shout out to Patrick Washington, shout out to Shout Mouse Press, shout out to A26DC. Um, Y'all, one more time, please give it up as they come back on stage. Uh, Kalea, Zanai, Kenyon, Amira, Najee, Sasa, Sanaya, and Malachi, y'all, please. Uh, these extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary young people are why we are actually here. Um, we, uh, as I was first coming on the microphone today, I explained that my title uh, was Vice President of Social Impact. It's social impact. It's not social stay the same. It's not social things don't change. It's social impact. We are committed to such here at the Kennedy Center, and this is the impact that we seek. Uh, this is actually our American future uh, right here. God bless y'all. Thanks for being here today. Hope to see many of you uh, in the concert hall for the What's Going On Now concert. Um, thank you, A260C. Thank you, Shout Mouse Press. Uh, thank you, Words, Beats, and Life. And thank y'all for supporting them. We will see you on the path. Peace. for joining us at Millennium Stage. For more information about the upcoming Millennium Stage programming, please visit us online at our website or on Facebook. At this time, we ask you to head toward the back of the seating area so we can safely clear the area. If you would like to meet with the artist, you can do so at the back of the house. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening at the Kennedy Center.